the stage one redesigned by Dr. Simon Wong, the lower, we, some of my students have said that appliance in itself should get the Nobel Prize. His results are insane in the lower arch. And he has case after case after case, and this is a consecutive sample, so it's not like he's taking out the bad cases. It's like every single case, it's in the sample. And when you look at that, you go, there's no reason why every single orthodontist on the planet should be using this appliance and expanding everybody's lower art. Dr. Sandra Khan, thank you so much for joining me today on this JawCast episode. It's an honor to have you. Of course, you are the author of this book here called Jaws, Story of a Hidden Epidemic, which has been hugely influential in the space, hugely influential for me personally. I have often thought of this book as, so I've heard Dr. Mew say frequently, they will not accept uh, the evidence I've put forth that malocclusion is primarily environmental and not genetic. Do you think this book successfully makes the case that malocclusion is primarily environmental and not genetic? Absolutely. I think uh, we gather the, the evidence and we're uh, published by Stanford Press. And they have a very um, thorough system of proving or, or asking to you for everything you say to be proven. Although we do have to take in mind that books, you can write anything you want in a book. And the publisher, if they like the book, they will say yes. What's really been the, the what in Spanish we call it parteaguas, the, the cutting of the waters, has been our article on bioscience. I don't know if you're familiar with the article. But the article, to be published in, in a journal like bioscience, you really have to do your homework. And I, I gather that number one geneticist in the planet Dr. Mark Feldman, who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and Robert Sapolsky, also a member, Paul Ehrlich, um, Alternative Nobel Laureate. So the, these are three authors that are not controversial in, in any way. Whatever they say is always backed up by serious science. So the, the article on bioscience, um, the causes and cures, I forget the title, but in, of malocclusion, that's the definitive work that based on all the scientific research, uh, proves that malocclusion and development of the jaws is mostly environmental. Not completely environmental, but mostly environmental. The genetic part is really not there because it would take millions of years for us to evolve to have you know, malocclusion. So um, that's where the real evidence is. That came after the book, but the book is basically um, everything we say in it is, is uh, supported by serious science. Thank you. And so perhaps we could talk a little bit more about the thesis of that article. You know, maybe you could explain what would be your elevator pitch of the conclusion or the summary or the abstract of that article. And perhaps you could use this as an opportunity to explain uh, uh, the complexity between the relationship between environment and and genetics when it comes to uh, how uh, jaw structure has devolved over the centuries and millennia? Well, I, basically, let, let me open up the article here. This sure. It's been a couple years. So here's our bioscience article, which I'm happy to share with you guys. It's called The Jaw Epidemic Recognition Origins, Cures, and Prevention. And basically, that's what we're saying in the article. We, we know we recognize that there's a problem. The problem is quite modern. And we want to know where it started and what to do to cure it when it's happening and also to make sure it doesn't happen when it's not there. So, you know, I don't like the word prevention um, because prevention really is focused on a problem. And medical science, um, at least in, in our industrialized world, focuses on a disease and curing that disease. It doesn't focus on fostering healthy practices in order to be healthy. So we look at disease, we don't look at health. So prevention is, has that connotation, but it definitely what we did in this article was recognize that there's a problem. So we did put out all the evidence of the problem and where the problem started 
And then we said, if we don't want this to be permissive, permissive in society, these are the things that we can do. And by recognizing that there's a problem and knowing that the problem is really has to do with our practices, um, our lifestyle, then we can start taking out the, the parts of that lifestyle that are not conducive to health. And so that's what the article did. And then we always give out recommendations of what to do. But this article in bioscience, um, it's, it's really um, geared towards uh, supporting the thesis that crooked teeth is not something that we're just dealt in as a, as a hand in our genes, but it's something that we are creating by the way that we are um, interacting with our environment, with our food, with our breastfeeding, with the, the weaning, the consistency of the food, and the way we breathe. Mm -hmm. And could you dive into a little bit more detail about what are the major uh, in, uh, environmental uh, mistakes that we're making as a species that's causing this devolution in facial structure? You already mentioned a few very briefly, breastfeeding, uh, food composition, maybe some other things. Dr. Mew talks about how indoor living is, is a problem because of, uh, you know, the concentration of allergens. What, in your opinion, are the major causes here? Well, Dr. Mew is, is brilliant. Um, Dr. John Mew, he really has focused and put our attention, geared our attention towards the real causes of the problem. And the, the problem really, and our new book, Forwardonics, is really gearing on the the protocols that we suggest to be followed. And the number one issue, obviously we talk about posture because posture is where we spend more time. Action is short duration where posture is long duration. So we want to change our posture. And for that, we have to look at the way we breathe. That is the, the beginning of everything because we breathe all the time. The moment we're born, we're breathing even before we eat. So he, he focuses on the living indoors and, you know, we're, we have more allergens, we have more uh, particles in the air today. So the nose has to be looked at first. That is the critical part that we are not um, focusing on. We're thinking of chewing and other things that are secondary. And breathing is number one. If we don't breathe well, and as Dr. Wong puts it, if the small hole is clogged, the big hole will open. And respiration the, is the only um, action or the only function in our body that actually has two organs that can do it. Because everything else, you know, even though we have two eyes, they do the same thing, two ears, they, they, there's one organ that does everything, single thing. The respiration can be done by nose or mouth. It's ideal at rest to do it through the nose. And if we can't do it, then we compensate and we do it through the mouth. So that's the number one culprit is the nose. We got to make sure the nose is working, it's working properly, and it's working without any resistance, especially when we're asleep. We all know we grow when we're sleeping. And if we have any type of resistance, then our respiration is going to have to um, recruit the brain to help us. If we, if it, the nose is 97% free at night with no resistance, then you could see a person asleep and the chest doesn't move, the mouth is closed, and there's no noise at all. If we have any type of resistance, even a little one, then the brain has to recruit the muscles. And as soon as we recruit the muscles, then the brain has to be woken up and has to pay attention to the breathing. Normally, in, an, in, in a healthy person, the breathing is controlled by the brain stem, which is outside the brain. It's not in the brain. So if our chest is not moving, if we're breathing lightly, quietly, and our nose is filtering air properly, then we are not going to engage our brain. Our brain can be busy integrating memories, uh, you know, connecting the dendrites to, you know, deal with our emotions and all the things that we have to do, especially when we're growing. If our nose has resistance, then we will struggle, wake up the brain, have to use it, and we also will open our mouth to get that extra air because the air is the most important thing for to maintain life. Therefore, the nose is first, number one. 
Then we go to different things, and there's this cascade of issues and cascade of, of um, activities that we engage from birth, and things can go wrong at different timings. Dr. Mule suggests that breastfeeding is one of the, the critical parts. If we don't breastfeed long enough, if we don't breastfeed properly, then we are going to not help our jaws in development. What I feel that is more critical, and this is completely anecdotal, we have to separate what's anecdotal and what's scientific. But I like a phrase Dr. Mu uses, which is one case doesn't prove anything, but it can explain everything. So anecdotes are not great for proving anything, but they're good for explaining how things happen. In my opinion, the weaning, the introduction of solid foods is critical, even more than breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is important, but for me, when we go from breastfeeding into solid foods, that is where things really go away. And that's when, you know, in modern life, we take a spoon, we put it in the mouth with pop or something that's super mushy, and the, the babies, don't, they don't want this, and they don't know how to manage it. So what they do, I don't know if you have kids or if you've seen babies, but you put in the spoon, and they, we teach them how to slurp because they're not ready for that mush. And as a as proof, you can see the babies get the food all over their, their face and we clean it up and we shove it again. So we are forcing them to do something at a stage where they're not ready. Mush shouldn't be introduced until we have all our teeth, which is after 18 months. And naturally, if you look at the, um, at the way physiology works, the, the larynx is very high in a baby. A suckling baby cannot choke. So you can't give a six, a ninth, a 10, a 12 month old baby solid food. They're not gonna choke because the passage of air and the passage of food are separate. And when our teeth come in at our 18 months, that's when the larynx drops and that's when we are at risk of choking after a year and a half. So before a year and a half, we are safe giving babies solid food. And this is a trend that we are already seeing in society, which is exciting. And that will help. If you get a working nose, properly working nose, breastfeeding as much as we can, but we shouldn't um, you know, chastise women that can't breastfeed. Mm-hmm. But because um, I've seen good development, if they can't breastfeed, they use a bottle, but then they, they, they introduce food properly with the proper um, textures and with correct chewing and, you know, with mouth closed. And we have our program GOPEX. So we have kids that are two-year-olds that do the program and they are developing well, regardless if they were breastfed or not. So there's Mm -hmm. that cascade of events and we can, you know, focus on any one of them. And there's some that I think are more critical than others, but working nose, breastfeeding, and then introducing solid food before introducing mush. Those are the three things that I think are critical for jaw development. So you're saying most of the critical inputs are to to occur before the baby is, let's say, two or even three years old. So it's it's a critical period there in infancy that parents need to take advantage of if they want to get their child on the right track. Well, we all know that the first thousand days are critical to your whole life. And we're just learning what to recommend. But uh, through your work and through other people that are making this popular, uh, parents are already starting to have this knowledge earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. I asked Dr. Courtney Donko, who's another airway-focused dentist, about has she seen children who have had perfect inputs, but they still end up with poor development? And she said yes. And so I wanted to ask you, in this day and age when there's so much sickness and toxicity in the world and uh, epigenetic uh, hand-me-downs from parents to their babies, do you think, though, that sometimes there's uh, bad genetics that get thrown into the mix that even if a baby has a perfect first thousand days, they can still end up with issues that require orthodontic intervention in order to open up their nose and get them breathing and functioning right? Well, the the issue of perfect is relative. What is perfect? So my daughter didn't have any issues. She was breastfed till she was three years old. She never had allergies. 
I mean, you could say she was second born, so she was just grabbing food from her uh, brother. So she wasn't uh, spoon fed mush. And she had such a bad malocclusion that she ended up in surgery when she was 15 years old. So I realized that whatever we think is perfect may not be perfect. Uh, my parents have perfect jaws. My dad had a beautiful jaw. And my mom's still alive. She's 86. She doesn't have any crowding. Per and here I am with, you know, my own problems. And what went wrong, we don't really know. And perfect is not necessarily what we see as perfect. And in my daughter's case, she had a, a tongue between teeth um, posture. Why she developed that, we don't know. And that's one of the hidden malocclusions because she was cute as a button. My son, I was able to see him because he had an open mouth from day one and he had allergies and asthma. And he was like a, 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 a bookcase of you know what goes wrong my daughter i thought it was perfect and here I, I i mitigated my son and with my daughter she ended up in surgery so we don't really know what perfect is and what we are trying to to develop now is what we call transdisciplinary work so right now we have ents that work isolated and we have orthodontists that work isolated and we're never together under the same roof. And every day I do consultations with, um, with kids that I see with problems and they go to the ENT, ENT and the ENT says, everything's perfect. Tonsils, adenoids, everything's great. And when we really look at them, we go like, no, it's not great. And I just came back from a snoring workshop that we did in Mexico, where I was able to get Dr. Engelke from Germany, Dr. Rangel, it's a triple PhD, Dr. Rangel, neurologist and ENT, lab technician, general dentist, and orthodontist. We had our patients for a full week, seven days. We gave them sleep um, uh, halter to look at their sleep for seven nights, and they came to the office every day. We did endoscopy. We have that course all on video. If anybody's interested in, in watching it, go to our site, and we have the whole workshop. And we cured every single one of the people that came that had snoring issues. Why? Because we had five practitioners all in their same roof, seeing every patient together. Uh, Dr. Rangel did the endoscopy, put it in the nose, and we saw you know, how we were adapting the, the devices, how they were doing the uplock, how they were breathing, and even people that looked like everything was fine no overweight, no jaw problems, but they were snoring. We were able to understand what was going on because of the lateral collapse. Things that I, as an orthodontist, had no idea it existed. Mm -hmm. We had this one young kid, very athletic, perfect jaws, wide, um, wide arches, and he was snoring like a logger, young guy. And when we did the endoscopy, we saw that his collapse was lateral. So we were able to work with the uplock and work with a very, very lightly calibrated CPAP. And the lightly calibrated CPAP is critical. Because here at Stanford, they give people their CPAP and they have their mouth open and they just wear the mask. Or even when they wear the, the nasal um, cushions, they have their mouth open. So they're losing half of the pressure. So if you calibrate it properly, you teach them how to do the uplock, which is, you know, when you put your teeth together and you swallow, you take all the air outside your mouth and your mouth stays closed by suction. If you learn to do that, then your CPAC can be calibrated very lightly. And then the CPAC becomes an asset that is very comfortable to use. So we were able to work all these things together because the ENT doesn't know what I'm doing. I don't know what they're doing. The lab technician is doing something in a different room. So we had everybody together and we had the patient and the five of us looked at the patient together. And that was amazing. I don't know if that can be uh, replicated anywhere else, but that is the key. So again, to answer your question, what is normal? We don't know because the absence of disease doesn't mean things are normal. The fact that this is a normal, it could be normal because that's the norm, but that doesn't mean healthy. So normal doesn't mean healthy. And the fact that somebody sees that their baby says, I had a perfect uh, thousand days, 
but they have an issue. Maybe they didn't have perfect thousand days. Maybe they you don't really know what perfect was. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to have guidelines so that you can get as 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 best as possible. But in in what I see in modern life, there's no perfect because like we're walking around with shoes. Yeah. Just by the fact that we have shoes, we're not healthy. We need to touch earth with our foot, with our skin every single day. And I'm not a holistic, you know, hunter-gatherer type person. I, I, I'm in modern life, but I do understand there are things that we're doing. I was just, uh, I had a lecture this morning and we talked about the evolutionary times. Men, modern men has been in the planet for 200,000 years. Modern history is about 5,000 years. Mm-hmm. Just think about the percentage and the, the way they do it now is in a, if you think of a clock, a, a 12 hour, uh, the span of modern life is less than half a second in that 12 hour clock. If you mm-hmm. think of the time of earth. Um, so the time that we've been modern using shoes is tiny. You know, agriculture 10,000 years ago, modern men 200,000. So you think about how many uh, millennials we were walking barefoot and breastfeeding and living outdoors, and that was normal. We're not gonna get back to that. It's, mm-hmm. it's impossible, but we can mitigate things that we you know, live with the comforts of modern life, live indoors, but make sure we have a working nose, make sure we feed our kids properly, and when things go r- the wrong way, we have to mitigate early. Dr. Marisa Santos, I don't know if you've interviewed her. She's fantastic. She's my favorite practitioner in the planet. She's out of uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And she basically treats a lot of two years old, two year olds. Mm-hmm. These two year olds get expansion, get posture, get GOPEX, get their backs lined up. She just does everything when they're two. And by the time they're three, three they're perfect. So she's even working within those thousand days with mitigating things that are already wrong in two-year-olds. And she says every day she gets kids that are looking worse and worse that are two and three years old. By the time they're four, there's so much to undo from where they should be. But it can be done. It can be done. And it doesn't have to be hugely stressful or painful. She, she has a protocol. It's one year and he, she gets kids where they need to be. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've been asking this question a lot recently. How early is uh, early enough to put an expander into a child? You just mentioned two years old. That's the number I've been hearing from others. You think two years old, even if there's not really too many teeth, how do you even anchor an expander into a two-year-old's palate? Well, a two-year-old should have all the baby teeth. Okay. Because by the time we're 18 months, you know, the first uh, incisors should, should come in around six months old. Mm-hmm. And by the time we're 18 months, we should have 20 baby teeth. Mm-hmm. So we should be there. But the expanders that we use are not necessarily anchored to teeth. They are bone supported. And we use the plastic, the acrylic, to put that, you know, those forces, light sustained forces into the palate. Mm-hmm. So you're pushing a little bit every day. And so you're changing the palate. And yes, we use the anchor of the teeth, but we go under the, the embrasure of the teeth, so it doesn't matter. I used to work with uh, cleft lip and palate kids. I had kids that had obturators, you know, at months of age with no teeth. Mm-hmm. So you, we have different ways of anchoring, and it's not, it's not implants, it's not surgery, it's not screwing things in. It's just mm-hmm. using plates in their mouth and understanding how to get them to... to have an end of retention to stay Mm -hmm. and certainly two-year-olds are very difficult to manage unless you're a pediatric dentist you can't manage those kids it's super difficult i personally cannot manage two-year-olds for me four-year-old is the earliest i can manage the kids i can start with go packs i can start with other things at two but i don't get my hands in the mouth until four because emotionally for me it takes a toll. I don't know how to manage a two-year-old. Dr. Kevin Void, Dr. Marisa Santos, they're pediatric dentists. 
So they have the training to manage these kids very early. So we need to, as I said, work in transdisciplinary groups so that we have a pediatric dentist and an orthodontist working together. Right now, everybody's siloed and they're all in their little corner and they go back and forth and the poor parents, they just get, and this is in all of medicine, they just get different stories from everyone and nobody is you know, working as a team. Right, of course. So let's take a typical uh, modern day 18 month old child, right? Probably b- breastfed for three months or less during the mother's maternity leave. Uh, by the time that child is 18 months, maybe he's regularly breathing out of his mouth, drooling a lot, walking around like this, making lots of ah, ah, noises, that sort of thing. You can try manually closing that child's mouth and say, breathe through your nose and demonstrate, breathe like this. And they'll do it, they'll mimic you, but then two seconds later, right back to that. Do you think the best thing you can do for a child like that is to just pop in an expander and just give them the space to be able to breathe through their nose? At at that young age, are they already potentially in need of some sort of maxillary expansion just to be able to do what you want them to do in terms of nasal breathing? Or can you just instruct them verbally to get them to where you want them to be? Look, every child is different. There's yeah. not a, a, a recipe to follow at 18 months. A, I think 18 months is a little early. Mm. It depends on the child. I certainly had syndromic kids that got expanders even earlier than that. Mm. And, you know, if you have one or two teeth, it's enough to, to get the expander. But, you know, we did the kids that have Pierre Robin, that they, they can't possibly breathe. They are really, um, you know, compromised. So these kids would have a different um, uh, protocol than a normal child. A normal child at 18 really should be able to gear into the right practices, chew properly. Another part that's missing in our protocols is the, I just took a course on a neuro, uh, it's called RNO um, in Spanish, Rehabilitación Neuroclusal, Occlusal, Neuroclusal Rehabilitation. And basically, they, the baby teeth have to be filed so that there's a, a comfortable bite. And sometimes you look at these uh, 18 months old and they don't have a comfortable bite. So they don't even know where to bite because their teeth are not being used enough. They're not eating the solid foods and their, their baby teeth are made to be ground down. So this is something that we need to learn how to do because we don't do it in the U.S. And in Spain, where this, um, this theory is... Um, began about 50 years ago, they do a lot of that. And that gives the kids a very comfortable bite that's balanced on both sides. They can move everywhere. I just saw this that lecture at the, at the RNO meeting and there was a doctor from Brazil and he showed a two-year-old and all they did on this two-year-old was grind the teeth. They filed a little bit here, a little bit there, no treatment, no expanders. They taught the kid how to chew properly on both sides and they grind the teeth so that the the bite was comfortable. Because this is one of the problems. If the bite is not super comfortable and balanced, then the kids don't know where to bite so they keep their teeth apart. If a child has a pain, like a cavity, and even if the cavity is taken care of, they will split their teeth and put the tongue in the middle. I think that's what happened to my daughter. She didn't have a cavity, but she must have had some discomfort. So she started keeping the tongue in between the teeth. And that will develop the vertical problems and all these issues that she had. So this Brazilian doctor, she's a pediatric dentist, she showed the case of a two-year-old, which all they did was grind the teeth and teach her how to breathe, chew, and you know use her body properly. And she grew amazing. She never needed braces. And it's it's again, it's a case of one, but they're showing that this is what they do on their general practice in Brazil for kids that are, you know, 18 months, 20 months, two-year-old. They do this where they make sure their bite is super solid and they're chewing fine and they're breathing fine and they're working together. And then the kids are doing much better. So getting a bite correct in an 18-month-old is critical. And we're not doing that in the U.S. And the, the parents, they... They don't want us to grind the baby teeth. They think the enamel is, is uh, precious. But if we look at the hunter-gatherers, 
they were probably grinding their teeth as throughout their life. And this is normal for a species. And they had good airways. They might not have had good looking teeth that are you know, perfect in, in shape, but they had good airways. So sometimes we need to understand where we should go as a species and you know appreciate our, our nature for what it is. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Brazil as uh, sort of being at the cutting edge of some of this uh, treatment to help children develop properly. I also heard a long time ago about Brazil being very progressive about tongue tie and also about developing uh, national breast uh, breast milk banks so that infants can get a uh, breast milk easier if their mother isn't able to produce or maybe if they don't have a biological mother available. Is there something special about Brazil where they're very up to speed on this issue? And do you think it's a coincidence that some of the top supermodels and most beautiful people in the world come from Brazil? It's true. They, they, they have a, a very interesting mix of race and and um, they have things like, um, I know I've studied with Esther Gokhale for posture, to, for our posture programs. And she says the number one exercise you can do is capoeira, which is kind of like martial art. And that was developed by the slaves um, to do their, their martial arts and be able to defend themselves. But they were, you know, kind of uh, disguising it as a dance. So this capoeira thing, she says, it's amazing for back health. And so they do have traditional, you know, practices that are good. Um, you mentioned tongue tied. I'm not a big fan of tongue ties. Um, I don't regularly see it. I don't have a, a clinical practice right now. But even when I had a clinical practice, I didn't do a lot of them. I didn't see a lot. I know some of the uh, doctors that see young kids, they see the tongue ties as a problem. I think it's a little bit of an overkill because hmm. it's something the doctor can physically do. And I, I don't know. I don't see it as a problem unless it's associated with speech or breastfeeding early on in life. But mm -hmm. if that's not a problem, I don't see tongue tights as a big problem. I know the Brazilians do a lot of myofunctional therapy. And myofunctional therapy has its place and, you know, done well as part of, uh, of other therapies can be very helpful. And they, they do have a, um, a national program where you have a lot of myofunctional therapists um, uh, looking at children. You talk about a breast milk bank, and I'm, I'm not a neonatologist, I'm not a pediatrician, I'm not a, a, a lactation uh, consultant, but I, so I'm not gonna discard the value of the chemical composition of breast milk. It's huge in its value. Mm -hmm. However, in jaw development, you need to get it from the breast. It mm -hmm. doesn't help if you get it from a bottle, even though if it, it's breast milk from a bag. And that happened to my son. First born, I had no maternity leave. I was in the practice a week after my C-section, I was seeing patients. And I was, you know, I would take him with me, but then I would use the pump and then somebody else would breastfeed, you know, or my, my husband will give him um, the breast milk at night, you know, so I could get a nice rest and he developed really bad job. I don't know if that was the case, but, you know, going to, from breast milk through a bottle, it's not going to give you the suction. And the, the critical part for suction is the closing of the compartments, not necessarily the muscular force that, you know, it's important and it helps, but it's the sealing of the lips as a valve and the breast and the seal, seal of the very back of the throat. The, the soft palate, when that's sealed as a compartment, then the baby develops the pressure, the negative pressure, the suction. And this happens very fast in a baby, but when we look at the MRIs um, from uh, Medela and some of the other ultrasounds of the baby's breastfeeding, we can see that this compartment's closed and then pressure gets very high and then the, the seal breaks and then the milk is accelerated into the esophagus I mean, there's a whole process of things that happen when we're breastfeeding that are critical. Not just the muscular stuff, but the, the we call it physics of, of uh, fluids or fluid dynamics that happen when we're breastfeeding. That doesn't happen with a bottle. Yes, we need to create a closed compartment, but it's usually not done with the lips. Sometimes the tongue has to be um, uh, 
slide underneath that nipple as opposed to in the in the normal breastfeeding so there's things that happen when we're sucking from an artificial nipple and there's better nipples there's better uh, bottles now they're creating systems that help because like i said not everybody can breastfeed and that's why i think breastfeeding is critical but if you mitigate at the time of weaning on how you give the baby the food and how you teach them to close the lips and to make the seal with the tongue on the roof of the palate, not necessarily slurping forward. Because when you put in a spoon, there's no other way. The tongue cannot go to its place. So I think that's more important and it's something that everybody can do. You can say, I couldn't breastfeed, I didn't have milk, or I had to go to back to work. Or There's reasons why people cannot breastfeed. But weaning properly, anybody can do. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, uh, so you describe this suction that's created in the baby's mouth as the baby suckles the breast. Dr. Mike Mew has often taught mewing for adults, because you know, a big part of his audience is adults that want to improve their facial structure. He has often described the right way of mewing as creating a suction at the roof of the mouth. And I've echoed that as well on my channel. I personally find the most effortless way to keep the tongue on the roof of the mouth is to sort of keep the lip sealed, swallow, swallow, swallow until a vacuum is created between my tongue and the roof of the mouth. And that's what I describe as suction mewing. Do you think there's a relationship between uh, the suction that an adult can create and the suction that uh, a baby creates when they're suckling? Do you think it's the same action? Yeah, it's all a gradient of pressures. We have a a new book called Breathe 4.0. It's in design now. And we go through all that in our book. Um, it's a complex book. It's uh, almost 500 pages long. But this this thing about creating that close compartment mm. is critical. And I'm not that familiar with mewing, and I've looked into it, but it's just you know a little bit of above my head. I do. <laughs> I have used some of the things that I've learned from Mike Mew, like putting um, using the gum and teaching your tongue to push the gum up. And but when you guys talk about sealing your lips, that is uh, a misguidance of what mm. we're doing because the lips shouldn't be sealed. It should be something that happens naturally. And if you're putting attention on certain things, I remember when I was taking pictures in the mouth or working as a dentist, I would tell a, a resident, "Don't ever use the word tongue. Don't tell the the patient." Oh, move your tongue to the side. Because the moment you say tongue, you, the brain says, oh, tongue, did you call me? Here I am. And the, you can <laughs> never get rid of the tongue, right? So you need to just say things like create a vacuum. If you don't have your lips closed, you can't create a vacuum, although you can. But the lips have to be completely um, relaxed. You cannot have tight lips. Because the moment you have tight lips, then you, you're recruiting muscles. And you want it all to be with dynamics of fluids. You don't want dynamics of solid bodies. Muscles are dynamics of solid bodies. And we need to understand the difference between solid bodies and fluids. So dynamic of fluids versus uh, mechanics of solid bodies. And we need both of them, but one is movement and the other one is more related to posture. So we've created, I don't know if you're familiar with our, um, with our uh, vacuum activators. But the vacuum, the, the way we use the vacuum activator is you put it on and you suction three times really hard. And that way you vacuum or you take all the air out of your mouth. And just like a, like a suction cup on the window, when you take out all the air, it stays on the window. And you don't have to push the suction cup. The suction cup will stay glued on by that superficial tension. So the, this, uh, this device is help you recognize that because when you have no air in the mouth, this bubble will go in. Mm -hmm. Your teeth are together, the bubble will go in and you recognize that and then it becomes second nature so that you don't have to put any thought or effort. Another thing that I see as a problem is when we talk about put your tongue in the tongue point or in the spot. If we think about putting it the tip of the tongue, first of all, tongue doesn't have a tip. The tongue is a U. We can make it into a tip, but it doesn't have a tip. It's not like a tail. So when we tell people to put the tongue tip, then we are going to keep the back of the throat open. 
If we just go like suction, then the whole tongue will go up and the soft palate will also get glued on and the airway will be left um, open. And the negative pressure inside the mouth will translate into the suction, the natural suction of the nose. So when you have negative pressure in your mouth, your nose will work more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And this is also what you know we're doing with our patients where we teach them how to suction your teeth together. And when you suction, you make a lot of pressure. The suction sometimes is 200 millibars of negative pressure. We only need about 10 to 15. So it's very light pressure, but there should be no air. So it's a minimal pressure so that there's no air, no empty space inside your mouth. And that's a better way of teaching posture than telling you to do something. It's just suck all the air up and then stay like that. Just freeze yourself like that. And then if it's too hard, just let go, let go, let go. And then if your things pop out, then you know that was too much. So do it again. And it takes a while to recognize it. We now have uh, um, activators and, and uh, up lockers in, in, in development that actually have manometers that read the pressure inside your mouth. And when you see it in a screen, you can actually control it and you can work and practice meaningfully to create that suction. And I'm very excited that our new, our new up locker is connected to, to Netflix and to other TV and, and video games and different things like that. So that when you have the, you're in the right zone of pressure, your Netflix show runs. So it's really fantastic because we all want to sit down and watch our TV. And mm -hmm. if we can do something that requires no effort, but we're just meaningfully getting there and staying there for 10, 15, 20 minutes, that's enough to make it you know, recognized by your brain as the best position to rest. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to sleep, you will rest with no air inside your mouth. And that would make your, your breathing very efficient. Gamifying these things is always extremely uh, uh, helpful, especially to the younger generation. So I think that's very clever. Is that a uh, tool or appliance, or whatever you might call it, that uh, teaches the habituation of suction? Is that available for adults? Does that require a prescription? Where can people uh, buy that? Well, this you can get through our site in Forward Onyx. This is the manual one. Yeah. And it's very simple. The problem with this is that people tend, including myself, we tend to do too much with it. We always think the harder we work, the better. And it's not necessarily like that. So when you use it, you sometimes need to get an external manometer and measure what's going on. So the best thing is to find a practitioner or a dentist that already knows how to use it. But anybody can buy it online. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at promoting my own products. But um, this is definitely something that can help. And I'm trying to get more dentists trained. So the, the first step would be to go to our site and, and watch some of the videos. We have uh, a whole e-learning platform where you can see Dr. Engelke, who actually developed this device. And he's a triple PhD, he's an ENT, maxillofacial surgeon, phonoaudiologist. So he has the, the transdisciplinary science inside of him. So he's the one that developed this because he said the ENT understands this, but doesn't understand this. And Dr. Rankel says that they're treating patients without a mouth and we're treating mouths without a patient. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Engelke has a three PhDs. He understands um, how this whole um, oropharyngeal system works, nasal oropharyngeal system, nose, mouth, throat, which we now call four compartments, not three, but four, because the mouth has two separate compartments. So we have one compartment is the nose, two in the mouth, one is the throat. So we have, but that's why we called our book Breathe 4.0, because 4.0 is the four compartments. Mm -hmm. So this, the best thing is to have a practitioner, uh, learn how to use it and, you know, monitor the patients. Myofunctional therapy, speech pathologists, they can use this and they can use an external manometer and have the patients come in once a week or once a month and make sure they're using it properly. Once you use it properly, your brain figures it out. And this is very complementary to mewing because mewing is the muscular part, mechanics of solid bodies. This is what we were missing, which is the dynamics of fluids. And to be healthy, you need both of them. You can't, you know, I haven't talked a lot about chewing and, and using your muscles properly, 
but that's definitely part of the picture. So we have to complement both types of mechanics to stay healthy. And adults can definitely learn to do this. They may need a little expansion, but even without expansion, they if they can swallow, they can use this. And uh, if they can't swallow, this will help them regain, because we have patients that have dysphagia, that either cleft lip uh, kids, they can't do the seal, or Alzheimer, elderly patients. And this can also help them recognize how to generate that suction. You said some adults need expansion before they can really get the most out of a tool like that. Is that because their mouths and their facial structure is just too small to be able to have entry into some of these practices? Yeah, definitely. If you have certain you know, morphology or what we call architecture, you might not be able to hold on to that pressure. Yeah. If you can swallow, but the swallow occurs very fast and you cannot hold it, that suction afterwards because your tongue has no room. We are working with patients in different totally different morphologies, different architectures, but ideally you need to have good width of your palate. But even patients that don't have it can benefit by recognizing this. And, you know, I'm a big fan of surgery. I had surgery myself and make a huge difference in my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, if the problem is there and you recognize it and there are modern techniques that can help you, it's great. But a lot of people will not have surgery and they can still learn to create this suction in different ways. And we definitely can help people. Uh, you know, if you have obesity and you have a lot of uh, uh, adipose tissue in your throat, in your neck, then you're going to have a harder time. So there's things that we have to do for every case individually. Mm -hmm. you, when you say you had surgery, are you referring to MMA surgery? How do you feel about... Uh, the best ways to expand adults. On my channel, I've sort of drawn a distinction between dento-alveolar or tooth-borne expanders and then skeletal expanders like Juan Moon's MSE. What are your thoughts on the state of the market uh, for adult expansion? And of course, surgery will be a part of that discussion too. Look, I'm not a fan of MSE because I've, I've had bad experiences myself. I've had patients of mine go through... MSC go through surgery to expand plus the the implants and there's I had some patients that had uh, problems with leveling mm -hmm. that we could never fix afterwards I had patients that have gone through the clinic of uh, Dr. Juan Moon parent of one of my patients and you know they had such a bad experience we had to remove the the expander uh, for them and they even had issues uh, with necrosis of the bone. So I'm not a fan of MSC. I only work with two surgeons. My surgeon, where I had surgery, is in Spain, in Barcelona. And he doesn't pay me to, to promote him or anything, but I wouldn't work with anybody other than him. He is, for me, the Joe Whisperer. Mm -hmm. And he had my daughter had surgery by him when she was 15. And all that said, the stage one mu appliant works very, very well with adults. It is fantastic with adults. I have cases to show with adults. Dr. Um, Simon Wong has really, really impressive cases that he's done with the, um, the Mu Stage 1, which is acrylic, and utilizes what we call um, uh, resorption. Constant forces resorb and reshape the bone. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't open the suture. So I don't think it's necessary to open the suture. That is more of a traditional orthodontic view. Mm -hmm. So I'm a fan of doing the expansion with the stage one mu, even in adults. It works fine. There are really good examples, but you have to go to a practitioner that knows exactly how to do it. And there's very few that really know how to do it. And then the adults don't want to wear uh, something removable. And right. it's not really removable. It's a, you remove it just to adjust it, but you have to 24-7 use it. And most adults, I wore it myself. I did my expansion before my surgery. And it takes a while before people can understand you. And if you have a job that requires you to be very, um, you know, very understandable when you speak, it just, it's tough for adults. So they rather have something with implants that's screwed in 
and the profession is very happy to do it and not deal with compliance from the patients. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm not a fan of MSC. That doesn't mean it can't be a good treatment in the right hands, but I personally will not go through it because of my experience. Right. I agree with you. MSC is like a stick of dynamite in the mouth. It can be used to do good things, build highways and and so on and so forth, but it can also be very destructive. And on my channel, we've been very transparent about some of the risks associated with MSE. I had, I've had a few guests on now that have showed grotesque asymmetries uh, where one side was expanded, you know, a centimeter and the other side hardly moved. And now they're in a total uh, Brody bite on that side. And it's like uh, facing an, an orthodontic Mount Everest to fix that. Uh, and so, the leveling, the leveling is insane. Right, it's like a three-dimensional asymmetry where not only do you get a side-to-side sort of extreme crossbite in some cases, but you get, like you said, this cant that forms where one side, usually the side in my experience that expands more, drops as well. Uh, that being said, assuming the field can tighten itself up in various ways through improvements, so on and so forth, do you think that MSC has the potential to be a useful tool if we can sort of rein it in? Or do you think that using a metal expander, a TAD, TAD-assisted expander to split the mid-palatal suture, do you think it's an inherently flawed approach that's a dead end? Look, uh, Dr. Federico Hernandez Alfaro in Barcelona, he has a technique, it's 10 minutes in the chair with an expander that's 3D printed for the patient. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he goes in, there's a video online. That, you know, if you send me an email, I can send it to you because I show that a lot. And he, it's a 10 minute procedure. And he has it right because he does a split surgically and then he puts the implants and then he guides it and then just holds it. And I find with his technique, you really control everything because you do it all surgically and you just hold it. You're not exploding things. So if right. um, if the profession wants to learn what he's doing, which is a 10-minute in-office procedure, it's not in the OR. It's an in-office procedure where the patient awoke and the the procedure of just cutting things and, and, and not ex- expecting things to happen but doing them themselves. Uh, and having the the capacity, the knowledge, and the um, the information to do it right. If you know the anatomy and you know what you want, you can get there. So if if that becomes more prevalent, I think it's a great um, great um, asset because keep in mind that you can't do expansion and MMA together. We used to think you could do a three piece maxilla, but now we know that that compromises the airway. So we can't do that anymore. It can't be done in one procedure. So you need to do the expansion first and then the advancement. And if anybody wants to do it together, I mean, I, it, it might work for them, but in my experience, it has to be two separate procedures and nobody wants two separate surgeries, right? But if the airway is your main goal, then you have to do that. How does the three-piece segmental compromise the airway? Look, it's, it's more for the surgeons to explain, not sure, for me, sure. but I've sat with Andrew Liu at Stanford and he yeah. drew it and he drew like the Y yeah. of the three Ps. And when he drew it for me, it just made total sense because you're cutting in three pieces and you're doing this. So the back segment stays where it is. So even though you're widening, the part that's attached to the soft palate to the back, it's not, it's not moving. So it compromises the the improvement, and he he can do the what he he calls it the the mini dome, which is the distraction, so that he can do that first, and then he does it the uh, the the uh, MMA. But in his hands, it's like two separate big surgeries. So as we get better with this, hopefully we can go the route of uh, Dr. Alfaro, which is one very, very minor, min, he called it, there, there's an article, he's been doing it for over 20 years, minor, m- minimal invasive maxillary expansion surgery. So it, he calls it minimally invasive. It's 10 minutes and it works really, really well. Sure. So, so 
So what does what does he do? I, I imagine he goes in, he splits the suture. Does he split the suture from the roof of the mouth with like a piezo knife or something, or does he chisel it down from above the front teeth? Yeah, well, and and if you watch the video, I mean, I'll send you the link okay. to it. He goes in through the the tissue over here, and mm -hmm. he's also uh, I think he's also an ENT, so he knows his anatomy of the nose well. Yeah, and sure. you have to you have to know that because you can mess up somebody's nose. You can create a white nose, so it's it's for somebody that really really knows the anatomy well. But he goes in through here, and separates, and then puts in um, uses a. a, a it's like a burr, it's a, a striker um, chisel, or but it's it's a turban. And he goes in and then just basically cuts exactly the anatomy where he needs to. Then he goes through here into the sides and separates what he needs to separate. And then he goes in and just clicks it. And then it separates, but it's like marking a, a paper and folding it several times. And then you go in and cut. Mm -hmm. So he does that with the burr and then he separates it with a spatula. And so he cuts exactly in the place that he needs. And then uh, even before he does that, he puts in the screws, the, the, the appliance is, is um, it's printed in a 3D printer to the anatomy of the patient. So the screws are measured exactly like I, as an orthodontist, I tell the lab exactly where I want the screw. And so they print a screw that's the size exactly for that patient. And then it just fits in like a glove because it's printed. And then he puts it in, he puts the screws, and then he does the surgery and he unscrews it so he gets the width on that surgery. And then the patient goes home just to maintain it. He doesn't right. turn this, the, the screw or anything. It's just maintenance. Right. So like he's, he's not allowing for the appliance to have distortion and to get twisted and, and turned in its battle with the maxilla to split, which... I've always said I think a big cause of uh, MSE asymmetry is that when you don't have a thorough surgical assist, the appliance fights with the bone and the bone is tough. And then in its battle with the suture to split, it gets twisted and it might start angling diagonal and it's not in the orientation that the doctor put it in in the first place, assuming they put it in correctly at all because that's very tricky too. So if you can split the suture... Uh, before you start turning the appliance, then the appliance can have a more clean left-right transverse movement without getting all twisted and turned by its attempt to expand. And so just a, a plug for what I consider to be a major inv advancement in um, MSE treatment is now there's more and more of the piezoelectric surgical assist where the patient basically leaves the office with the split. And I know there's issues with necrosis with uh, piezoelectric. There can be, Dr. Joseph Yusefian mentioned that when I interviewed him. He said he stopped using piezoelectric because there were necrosis issues on the mandible during his um, midline uh, mandibular expansion. Uh, so I know it's not a perfect solution, but it does seem to uh, resolve some of the issues with potentially root causes of MSE asymmetry. So I'm hopeful for that, but it's even even most MSE uh, providers are not doing that. So there's still a huge risk for anyone getting an MSE in terms of asymmetry. Well, the, the lower is a completely different animal. There's no suture. Sure. So I don't even understand why anybody would want to split a suture that doesn't exist. But the stage one redesigned by Dr. Simon Wong the lower we some of my students have said that appliance in itself should get the Nobel Prize because the results in it are insane and Dr. Wong has case after case after case his his uh, cases are being looked at by the number one researcher in vertical growth um, um, in um, in Texas A&M and his his results are insane in the lower arch and he has case after case after case, and this is a consecutive sample, so it's not like he's taking out the bad cases. It's like every single case, it's in the sample. And when you look at that, you go, there's no reason why every single orthodontist on the planet should be using this appliance and expanding everybody's lower arch through this appliance that uses um, um, contact resorption. Because it changes the whole morphology of the of the bone, and we can change our bone at any time in our life. 
So all you do is put pressure on one side. So the, the bone cells die on one side and they build on the other one. Just like if you, you, uh, you break an arm in your 60s, it will still heal. So this appliance is fantastic and the patients wear it. It's zero intrusive. You don't even know it's there. It's a fantastic appliance and it frustrates me that every single orthodontist is not using it. Like my student in Spain, she said, this appliance should get the Nobel Prize because when you start using it, you realize it changes everything. And I know Dr. Yusefian and, and he should be using it. I'm going to talk to him and see. Uh -huh. um, you, you need a good lab and you need to understand what the instructions are to the patient and the patient needs to follow the instructions. But if everything is done well, it is fantastic. And I, I urge you to, to learn more about the lower mu stage one as redesigned by Dr. Wong. Sure. So how, how would you respond to a potential rebuttal to that, which is that if you use dental alveolar expanders in adults, a lot of times what you get is tooth tipping, bone resorption, gum loss, root resorption. How is this different? Well, you, you need to look at the research. You need to look at the cases and... Hopefully, there'll be cases to look at uh, coming from um, from uh, Dr. Bushang at uh, Texas A&M. There was a study um, at, uh, by Dr. Flores Mir, also in, in um, Canada. So you got to look at what's going on. And when you look at the photographs, you know that this is not dental alveolar because we use a plastic. The plastic goes down onto the bone. We I do see. hold from the teeth. But really, the resorption is, and you can see the horseshoe of bone changes. Mm -hmm. So this is not dental alveolar. And the trick is to design the appliance well, because if you take a, a natural orthodontic appliance, it is dental alveolar. But this appliance is based on, Dr. Wong is not even an orthodontist, he's a general dentist. And it's based on general dentistry principles, the principles of, of dentures. So you eat with it. If you don't eat with the device, then it's not going to work. It's going to be dental alveolar. But if you eat with it, then you're transferring all these mechanical forces into the bone to change the bone. So you got to understand the principles. Um, the Dr. Wong has so many courses, so many things online. Um, Dr. Mew has books showing this. And uh, his book, uh, Causes and Killer of My Occlusion, is an amazing book. And he's looked at the biology he understands the histology of the cells, the bone cells, and it's just, it's there. But we are comparing apples and oranges. Dental alveolar orthodontic uh, appliances are no good. This is not a dental alveolar. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a bone um, anchored device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're huge fans of Dr. Wong on my channel. I think uh, two or three weeks ago, I had a video demonstrating some of his 155 consecutive cases, and I have another one coming out soon. So, you know, we're huge fans of his and uh, totally give him all the props and respect in the world. Um, so I, I'd be interested to learn more about how this distinguishes itself from other toothborne expanders, which my in my experience, in my own personal experience as a patient, but also the consensus that I've gathered from anecdotes uh, from dozens and dozens of patients that I've spoken with is that toothborne expanders, unless they're very carefully used or unless it's very carefully designed, um, are very limited and have the potential to do more harm than good. And in general, I've advised against them, but I'm open to learning more about this uh, perhaps more refined version or it, or it might look like a toothborne expander, but it's actually not as you're suggesting. So I'm eager to learn learn more about that. Yeah, I mean, you, you said the key, it has to be carefully designed. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you follow the seven habits of highly successful people, but you have to have an end in mind. And then you also have to sharpen the saw. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that. If you just say, okay, I'm going to learn this really quickly and put it in because I have no time, it's not going to work. If you're going to do it, you need to sharpen the saw and make sure you learn and you understand. And the the... It's frustrating for, for providers because there's no lab technicians that can make these appliances. Dr. Wong uh, trained his own lab, and I don't have a clinical practice anymore because I don't have a lab. That's the reason I stopped is because 
it was just too demanding on me. I didn't have a good lab and that lab has to be impeccable. And the good labs, they will not work with you because they already know everything. So they polish the appliance really nicely. They bend the wires nicely, but they don't understand the principles of general dentistry. So this is a two professions and only Dr. One was able to, to solve the, the puzzle because he's a general dentist and he did dentures that you need to use for chewing. So he knew how to redesign the appliance so you could eat with it and it would be non-intrusive. Orthodontists, we don't care. We throw things and if, you know, if they're intrusive, we'll just find a screw to make it permanent. <laughs> but this appliance has to be removed for the correct uh, activation of it. It cannot be fixed. And orthodontists, we don't like to remove things. We rather screw 10 screws in somebody's head than teach them how to manage in the place. And the labs are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think an interesting comment I can make is that Dr. Lipkin, who is my dentist, he's obviously an MSE provider and he's done hundreds and hundreds of cases. He's out in Westwood, New Jersey. He said that his success rate with the MSE increased dramatically once he started uh, making them uh, in-house in his own lab. So there does seem to be something about uh, subtle improvements you can make to the appliance when it's totally in your control in your own lab. It does seem to be the difference between success and failure. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, doctor, and we'll wrap up uh, shortly, uh, Another plug for one of your inventions, the Forwardontics Bow face mask. So you don't like MSE, but so how do you feel about the fact that your your bow face mask is a fan favorite amongst MSE using adults? I think it's fantastic because it's a tool that was non-existent. The only reason I created it was because I needed it. I wasn't thinking of anybody else. I was thinking of my own son. And he actually holds a patent on it. He's 21 now. And he's the one that says, Mom, none of the things that you're giving me. And I took him to, to Mew and he did the, the head brace on him. And he says, Mom, none of this is working. And I said, well, if you're so smart, why don't you design what will work for you? And he says, I need to have an anchor through here. And I said, well, how are you going to move your head? And I said, she says, you, you figure out, Mom. Have a knee, rotate, something, but you make it. So I spent $200,000 of my own money making this device for my son. And it worked so well. And you can see his photographs online everywhere. It worked well. And finally, he's not wearing it. But he, you know, obviously he had a personal interest in wearing it. But until his 20s, he was still sleeping with it because he loved the feel how his airway opened up when he wore it. So if you take this tool, and you match it to something that's right, it's fantastic. And if you have MSC that's right and it works well, I'm very happy. I know that um, the DNA appliance people, they use it a lot. And, and the DNA, I'm not familiar so much with uh, Dr. Singh. I know him for years, but I've never really used his device. But I know that they put it in, uh, they hook it to that device. And the bow is just a tool. It's like having a fork and you say, well, what about the meal? You know, you can use a fork with different types of meals. So right. this is just a tool. And if you know what you're doing and you're thinking forward and you're not putting any retrusive uh, force on the jaw, that gives you the place to hook on whatever you need. And uh, if it works for the MSC people, I'm you know thrilled and I, I want to make it more available because it's it's a great device. If somebody is interested in getting FDA approval for it and put it out in the market, I will be thrilled because right now I've already spent too much money creating it and it would take another 100,000 to get FDA approval. Mm -hmm. I don't see why it wouldn't be approved because all the materials are approved and it's basically the same as having a face mask that's already approved. It just goes to a different part in your body, but it's it will take uh, a lot of money to get the approval. But anybody that's listening that wants to take it off my hands, I would be very happy because I do think it's... it's. And I get testimonials all the time. I had um, people that have worn the other mask that touches your face and they look at it and they say, oh, that's gigantic. I don't want to wear that. 
and they say, well, just try it. And when they put it on and they, they, there's nothing touching your face because it goes from here to here. So your face is free. They love the feeling of it. And uh, people that have already worn either a petite or the layer mask that anchors here or here in your face, you know, the ones that anchor here, the petite is the easiest one for the orthodontist to wear, but it really damages the tissue here. Mm -hmm. And it pushes this down. So you get this vertical growth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the people that the kids or the adults that have worn it before, when they move, they totally, you know, they adore the, the freedom of the, of the bow. So yeah. I, I can't say enough good things about my bow. It's my, it's my first child. <laughs> That's amazing. I can't either. I've always recommended only two face masks, the crane that connects to the neck, but it's very difficult to get. Um, it's, it's not just, being made anymore. Right. It's, it's hardly even available. Uh, and then there's your bow, which in my opinion is, is uh, fantastic. So is it, possible for people to still get them you said it's not fda approved yeah. but they're still for well sale? you can get it you can get it through my site but you don't get you have to sign off that's not a medical device and that you're not going to use it without an orthodontist and it's just like any of those and it comes from spain so it's not in the u.s physically Under, so understood you have to pay for shipping and it's not it's not a it's an expensive appliance to make because it has a the curvature and the the stainless steel and all that is, it's, it's very, it's, it's not like, this is a cheap thing. This has FDA approval. Um, and it's very cheap because it goes to a mold and, you know, it's made in, in the U.S. because the uh, silicone is, you know, approved for use in mouth. So this is something that you can pop and make, you know, thousands of them if, if, if it's necessary. But the bow is just a, a, an artisanal uh, very exclusive, I would say, um, device, but it, it works. It works very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful, if I can say so myself, and produces beautiful results in people who use it correctly and consistently. Uh, doctor, there's a lot of despair in the community, in my audience, a lot of people who feel like things are getting worse, not better. Uh, your book, Jaws, and we'll wrap with this question, your book, Jaws, is, I think, the magnum opus of optimism and hope for uh, what the potential that this community has in terms of normalizing uh, culture, habits, uh, education that leads to healthy facial development rather than this, uh, to use a strong word, mutilation uh, that we've seen in the past and uh, degradation of uh, habits as a result of poor education coming from all levels of uh, society. Do you think, doctor, uh, things are going to get better? Are they going to get worse? Do you have hope for the future? What does the future of orthodontics, dentistry, and the human face look like? Well, I'm, I'm excited because I think um, we are now recognizing the problem, and that's step one. And my device with the Bluetooth is really going to take off like fire because when you attach it to your Netflix series... There's no way anybody is not going to use it. And so also, we are going to do a Kickstarter campaign. And the device is going to be um, very, uh, very strict about wanting to make it $100, no more than that, with the electronics and everything, because I want everybody to be using this. It's not about the business. It's about making it available. If it costs me $100 to make, I will sell it for $100. So I want that to be available. I think this is going to be huge. We finished the book Breathe Point uh, 4.0 with Dr. Engelke. That's coming up, and I'm writing a new book with Dr. Um, with again with Dr. Ehrlich and with um, Dr. Renhel. It's called Nose Capital N Capital O for Nitric Oxide Nose, and it's about this transdisciplinary work together with the ENT, um, the evolutionary biologist, and the the orthodontist. And um, that book is going to take a little bit longer. But it's really going to revolutionize the, the, the idea because just talked about this and we ignored this and now we're putting the pieces together and we have the, we'll have the information, but we also have the way to get your jaw to rest in the right uh, position at any age, even if you don't have enough expansion. You can still use these appliances to generate that suction. And if you teach your brain how to 
be comfortable with it and recognize it, it's going to really make a huge change for everyone that wants to, to have a, a good life and wants to breathe better. That sounds fantastic, Doctor. You're up to so much. I mean, there's so many different projects that you're working on, and they all sound wonderful. Is there a place where people can kind of follow you and keep up with all of your products and all of your publications? Well, our website is forwardhonest.com, mm -hmm. and uh, we it's not a great site because I don't have a, a huge bandwidth, but you can look in there and send us an email, and there's uh, we have a YouTube channel where I'm constantly uploading videos. I have uh, five new videos that we did last month with athletes. Most of my work now is, uh, my research is being done with athletes. And we work with swimmers, we work with soccer players, we work with uh, people in the gym, tennis players. I'm a tennis player, my son's a, a college tennis player. So we play, we, we work with the, the players at NYU and um, with long um, endurance sports. So we did, uh, we work with, um, a biker, a professional biker, and the results were insane when they were, I don't know if you're familiar with the lip locker, but it's the, the one device that you can wear as you uh, do your exercise to potentiate your, your nasal breathing, your recovery with nitric oxide. And the stuff, the, those are in, the, in our, um, our YouTube channel. If you just put forward on it, they're all, I uploaded all that there. And anybody that's doing sports should be using uh, an up locker or a lip locker because it potentiates your recovery and the results we're seeing with these athletes are insane especially endurance one and even uh, we're starting to do some research with uh, mountain climbers and you know it's just the the frontier has just moved so far ahead with this recovery in sports and actually 415 today i have a i'm doing a, a lecture for um, trainers and they're begging me for these lip lockers because they've seen it on their their um, their students and the people that are working out in their boot camps and all this. Uh, they're more all these coaches are you know like life coaches and they teach nutrition and they teach you know how to you know use weights to stay healthy and they are dying to have these devices and I just need more bandwidth to get it to everyone. But the athletic part of what we're doing. It's incredible because as I started my talk with you, I'm so excited, is that we are looking at disease and it's the wrong way to focus health. We got to look at what the healthiest of the healthiest are doing. The wellness people. I don't know if you listen to, to Andrew uh, Huberman. I do. He's a col colleague at Stanford. We have done, you know, he loves jobs. He loves what we're doing. And he's actually telling people how to be healthier than healthy and if we know that then we can take the people that are not healthy to be healthier but we got to look at the people that are in wellness that are doing everything right and what we can do to improve that so the athletes the the high endurance athletes and the the people that are already looking at every part of their routines to make them better if we can improve them then we can improve the people that are not there so the idea is focus on health, not on disease. Very well said, doctor. All links to the things you're describing will be in the description. Uh, thank you for all that you do. It's been a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, and I'll keep following you. Okay, thank you, doctor. Bye-bye. All right, bye.